This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 23, recorded on December 16th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today to talk about microbes from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Vincent and everyone else. It's, it's great to be with you again. Good to have you back. How's everything? Everything is going well. The end of the semester is, is arriving, and we're getting ready for the next semester. So, you know, one thing stops and another starts. As it should be. Not a problem. Also joining me today from Yale University, not too far from where I am, Joe Handelsman. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Joe, we haven't had you here in a while. No, it's great to be back on TWIM, my favorite part of the week. Good to have you, and uh, it's good to have you at this penultimate TWIM for 2011. Maybe next year we'll have many more. Also joining us today, from Small Things Considered out on the West Coast, Elio Schechter. Howdy. How are you doing, Elio? Terrific. Yeah, everything's great. Getting ready for the holidays. You know, I live in a retirement home. So we have a statue to Santa Claus, and I thought that we should rename him Joe Hanukkah. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Make everybody happy. (laughs) Anyhow, things are fine here. Excellent. I bet the weather's 72 degrees and sunny, right? It's 72 degrees with a few clouds, which is uncharacteristic, but it's okay. We had some rain, actually, which is great. Yes. Yes, I understand in California when you get rain, you're really grateful for it. Oh, absolutely. You know it. <laughs> well, here in New York, it's pretty gray and it's getting dark, actually. It's eight degrees centigrade. Mm. Well, probably similar weather to what you have up there in New Haven, I would guess, Joe. Yeah, it's uh, extremely gray here. I would just amend that. Extremely gray. Yeah. Other than that, it's pretty similar. So today we have an unprecedented three papers to get through, and uh, I think we can do this. One of them is is going to be done by Alio, who picked it out, and then we have two others that I found in science that Michael and Joe will do. And the first one is a paper in PNAS called Mutually Facilitated Dispersal Between the Non-Motile Fungus Aspergillus fumigatus and the Swarming Bacterium Pennybacillus vortex. That's quite a mouthful. Mm-hmm. And, and Alio, you found this and you wrote me an email and you wrote that this paper is near to your heart. Now, why is that? Are you, are you infected with Pennybacillus? <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. Best I know, they're not pathogens to humans. Um, no, but I played around with this, uh, with this bug some time ago, and I'll explain it as we go along. So that is why it's near. But I'll tell you, I, I'd like to generalize about this. We're talking here about the dispersal of microbes, the transport of microbes from one site to another. And it's obvious that for survival, um, any species needs to thrive, needs to be able to divide, mutate when necessary, but also to find new niches. In the aspects of biology where this is well studied, for instance, in the fungi, when it comes, for instance, to mushrooms, there's a lot known about how spores are dispersed over distances. And we accept that when it comes to animal parasites, they go through unbelievable contortions in their life cycle, or to have a stage in the life cycle which is suitable for passage to other other environments and other hosts. For instance, they use, and they use, for this process, they use insects and they use other things. So a lot of biology is about transportation. And in a way, we don't think about it all that much when it comes to bacteria. Uh, As I say, in other parts of biology, this is commonplace and part of it, but I don't see a 
a division of bacterial transportation in any department of microbiology yet. <laughs> well, there was the motility people for a while. Yeah, that's right. The motility people have a lot to say about it because motility is, in fact, a mechanism. But the overall issues of transportation, I think, are sort of elusive because there's so many and they deal with so many aspects of it that it's very difficult to wrap your head around it, as they say. But we'll start. So here is a paper which tells you something pretty dramatic, namely that the, uh, these are two soil organisms. The fungus Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a common organism which is known also to cause very severe infections in immune, immune compromise. People is acquired undoubtedly by inhalation of spores because the spores are all over any organism that's in the soil tends to have, tends to do that. And the other is a bacterium, a gram-positive bacterium with a funny name, Pene bacillus. Now, let me break that up. Bacillus is what you know about the genus bacillus, has bacillus subtilis, bacillus anthracis, and so forth. This used to be, these guys used to be called bacillus, but they, by genomics it turns out a little bit different. So they gave him a name which is curious. Pene bacillus means almost bacillus. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so these almost bacillus guys look for the world like a bacillus, and here's what they do. If you were, and this is something that anybody who has a petri dish with agar in it at their disposal can do. Run, don't walk to the nearest source of soil. It can be uh, your potted plants, it can be your garden, any place. And take a little bit of that soil and place it in the middle of the petri dish. And wait a few hours, not, not that many, maybe six, eight hours. And what you'll see is that growing out of the grains of sand in the middle of the petri dish are bacterial colonies that look very funny. Some look like a fungus. Well, you're also going to find fungi, by the way. But uh, some look just like fungus. Uh, there's a thing called Bacillus cereus variety mycoides, which grows, which makes huge whorls all over the petri dish. And these are done by extension. That is, this is not anything mysterious. This is just a bug that makes enormous filaments and they push themselves along. But then you see something else. In between those things, you see some light, very translucent, little tiny trails. You see trails that look like bacteria and at the end of the trail, often you see something that looks like a colony. And if you look under the microscope, this can be a dissecting microscope, you see that these guys move. And they move at speeds which are pretty astounding. I mean, they can be as much as 10 millimeters in an hour, which means that they reach the edge of the petri dish inside of six, seven hours. They've covered the petri dish, okay? And this is not by extension of filaments. This is by actual movement. But you look at them, what you see under the microscope, these guys make rafts. These are rafts of uh, bacteria that look the, they're in parallel, lined up in parallel, one and ne next to the other. And here they are moving at these astounding speeds. So it's a lot of fun. I mean, if you just want to have fun, just look at it. You'll find them very easy to isolate because they go off to a part of the agar that's all to themselves. And you can transfer them to another petri dish if you want to. I'm going to try it next week, Elio. You do that because you, it's it, it's also an experiment that's doomed to succeed. <laughs> I like <laughs> that. Miss. I like you that. Can <laughs> you can get. I think we used to find these bugs in nine out of ten samples, so something like that. Uh, anyhow, so this has been known for a hundred years. The bug, by the way, had a nice name. It was called Bacillus circulans. Uh, the circulants had to do with the following. At the very tip of the vortex, as I said, the, you find disks of bacteria. So they look like colonies. And these rotate. So circulants is a good name for it. And the disks rotate if they're, uh, if, they, if they're young. There are not that many layers of bacteria. They will make a revolution in 10 seconds. Wow. Now, that's pretty fast because these are maybe 100 bugs across. The radius of this colony may be 100 bugs or 50 bugs or something like that. So they move around and they move and move and move and move. And then they, they, sometimes they do the whorls, which is translational movement. Sometimes they do these colonies, which is rotational movement. Okay, now. So, Elio, this is why they are studied because they're commonly found in soil and, and they display this unusual motility, right? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. I should let me amplify a little bit. The genus Penny Bacillus includes quite a few other bugs, and they are used in agriculture. They are supposed to be plant 
promoting rhizobacteria, in other words, bacteria associated with roots. And they are used, I think, they are used to inoculate certain plants, not necessarily the species we're talking about here, but other species of penny bacillus. And how they do it is not known, but they do a lot in the soil. They seem to be involved in solu solubilizing phosphate, in providing siderophores for the capture of iron, and who knows what else. They, they also make anti antifungals and antibacterial, so they're very complicated. And so they are no, in, in agricultural microbiology, they are well known. So this aspect that I'm talking about is really a laboratory curiosity with an implication for a possible role in the environment. Uh, so now, let's, let's for one thing, let's stop for a second and consider soil. Uh, soil is probably as complicated, if not more complicated, an environment as the human body. It's made up of granules, of grains, of sand, of different kinds of soils, uh, separated by space. The space can be air or can be water. And there is a tremendous amount of good things going on. In a typical soil, you find, what, 10 to the 8 bacteria per gram. Some you know an astounding number, and about uh, uh, in uh, I've forgotten the exact figure, but m milligram amounts of fungi in one gram of soil. So they're teeming with life, teeming with life, and to try to work out what they do is a difficult and b important because agricultural crops and the well-being for that matter the well-being of this planet depends on the well-being of plants. So anyhow, let me then. Go back. Well, let me add a digression here. And while there's a large mass of bacteria and fungi, more importantly from considering the genetic makeup, there's at least 10,000 different species of bacteria in that average gram of garden soil. That's the general rule of thumb. Some soils, depending upon how complex they are may actually have more species and then soils like sand may actually have fewer species for from a genetic makeup it's almost like it's pluripotent in terms of what it will be able to do and i think that's what's so remarkable I think you're right. That's exactly right. This is an immense subject. This is what how you can define it. It is certainly just has issues that arise at every turn, and very little is known about them. Because in part because it's so so complicated, you almost don't know where to start. On the other hand, people do work on it, so there is some progress. And this paper is a nice paper that deals with the general issue without telling you anything in particular about a given soil. So, let me take it from there. So, you take these bugs and you put them on 1% agar up to 2% agar. You don't have to have semi-solid agar. It can be real agar. And here they move. And the movement, by the way, is due to flagella. Uh, this is swarming, is flagella mo movement. There is other, other forms of movement which are non-flagella and which we'll talk about some other time. Uh, but these guys need flagella and they have plenty of flagella. Um, now, the experiment that these guys did, and this is a group of people from Holland and from Israel. Uh, I should say that the, um, the last author, the corresponding author, is uh, Eshel Ben Jacob uh, from uh, Tel Aviv uh, University School of Physics and astronomy. It's <laughs> <laughs> very telling because, in fact, uh, Ben Jacob, Ben Jacob is a physicist, and he go, well, goes about this with the insight that comes from being an outsider. That is from seeing things with new and different eyes. Uh, he's published, by the way, a fair amount about this, and he has a a museum-like gallery of colonies on Agar that are absolutely spectacular. Uh, Vincent, I'll give you a link for this so you can wow, add this to the, to the notes. Uh, it's really looking at pizza dishes like you've never seen before. I mean, they have really flower-like beauty. Immense. Anyhow, back to the business at hand. So what they did is to take this penny bacillus and mix it, mix with it spores, conidia, this is asexual spores of Aspergillus fumigatus which are quite a bit bigger than the bacteria. They're about five microns across the bacteria, maybe one micron across, micrometer. So they put them in the middle of the petri dish and the bacteria swarm. And guess what? 
they find that the conidia, the spores of the fungus are carried along to other places along the petri dish. And the petri dish, when you incubate it long enough, will show you colonies of the fungus all over the place. In other words, they were they, they're not motile by themselves. They can't move. So they are transported by the bacteria. And they have lots of video shots to prove it and movies. And it's spectacular. I mean, it's really unbelievable that something as big as that can be carried along. So these are... Um, this is piggybacking, but only what the load is much bigger than the pig. So piggybacking the fungi here is have no thing. shame. Fungi <laughs> have no shame. That's it. They're they're Fun. hitchhiking on the poor lowly bacterium, <laughs> getting them to move. I mean, this is tremendously clever. And just think of the selective forces that had to operate in order to get this mutual behavior that both probably serve some advantage to the bacterium and some advantage, the, the obvious advantage to the fungus is the fungus gets to move without having to, to uh, go airborne. That's right. And, exactly. and the bacterium is probably getting a selective advantage if the fungus is, is making a secondary metabolite. Oh, that either let's the wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I'll, 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 I'll get it. into that. I'll get it's better than that. I'll get into that. <laughs> okay. Uh, in in a while. But let me let me f first introduce you a little bit more about the penny bacillus. As you would expect from an organism that does funny things like this, it has a huge number of genes devoted to uh to signal transduction, to communication and so forth. In fact, it has three times more genes dealing with uh, two-component systems, with transcription factors, than almost any other bug. Well, other, or other than its cousins, other penny bacilluses. So, this is an aside, but uh, ben, Jacob, ben Jacob writes in a different paper that you can divide up bacteria according to the number of genes in the genome which deal with this kind of communication. And he calls, the, he divides them into three classes. Uh, this, this, he calls this a, a social intelligence factor, something like that. So, so he, he divides them into ordinary bacteria, gifted, and brilliant. <laughs> and penny bacillus is brilliant, no question about it. Is E. coli is ordinary, right? The E. coli is pretty ordinary, right? right. So Pseudomonas would be gifted, I would guess, something like that. Anyhow, uh, and there's a paper on that, which we can also refer to. So... Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the mechanism. The mechanism has to do with flagella, all right? In other words, if you don't have flagella, you can't move. And um, it also turns out that the flagella interact with the conidia. And this is seen in various ways. On the electron microscope, you can see that they're touching, they're really sort of surrounding the conidia, the flagella are. In addition, if you take purified flagella and you add them to the gamish, there'll be no movement. In other words, the receptors or whatever they are on the surface of the conidia will be occupied and the bacteria can't move these, uh, these neutralized, if you wish, or this bound uh, conidia with the flagella bound to them, which is kind of interesting. But, but those bacteria can still move on their own, right? The bacteria can move fine. They don't uh -huh. care, but they just can't move the cargo because the cargo is not recognizable by the bacteria. So there's a receptor on the conidia then, right? Recept there must be receptors on the conidia. That's not been identified, but I'm sure that's coming. And by the way, there's some specificity to this because these guys don't move every old uh, spore of fungi. There are many other fungi they tried, and some move okay a little bit. Some don't move at all. So there's something about the conidia which is recognized by the flagella. And the fungi they try, the other ones that are not moved, those are also present in soil, right? They're also soil bacteria. Yeah, the soil fungi. Yeah, they're, re they're relatives. In fact, even within Aspergillus, you find some that move, like uh, fumigators and some that don't. All right, so this is, this is the story. Now, this is certainly to the benefit of the fungus. The fungus in the soil, if you believe that this is what happens in the soil, gets to new places being pushed around by this bacteria. What's in it for the bacteria? This is what uh, Mike just brought up. And sure enough, you're right that the, the fungi may provide uh, chemicals, but they do something else. And this is unexpected. This is where this, the story just gets beautiful. Uh, fungi, as you know, make, or aspergillus, make aerial 
mycelia, that is mycelia which are sticking up in the air uh, from the surface of the agar or the surface of whatever they are. And the spores are made that way, the asexual conidian spores. Now, these, uh, this area of mycelium is made up of long filaments. So they ask the following question. What if we made a gap on the agar plate? That is, we cut out a trough half a millimeter across. Okay, if you do that and you seed one side with bacteria, they're not going to get to the other side. They just can't crawl down the, the plastic at the bottom of the trough. You with me? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, now guess what? They put the fungi and they let them grow into colonies, and the fungi make this aerial mycelium, and they have no problem spanning the distance. Mm. They make a bridge. And guess who crawls along the hyphae? The bacteria. Mm. <laughs> so the bacteria get to the other place. And they get to the other place because they are uh, somehow connected to the high field of the fungus. Now, this has been known for, uh, for a while for other fungi to do that. And what you see is biofilms of bacteria surrounding the mycelium, surrounding the hyphen. So the bacteria get to go to places which they could not cross because they would have to go through air. So the bacteria are carrying ladders with them. Bacteria carrying ladders with them, that's right. So the conidia are the ladders compacted, and then when they get to a gap, they expand the ladder, it makes a mycelium, and they crawl over it. That's right. <laughs> the, the, the ladder has to be about 100 times the length of a bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> Someone should be- tell the patent office, you know, that really small <laughs> ladder that's really expensive at the Home Depot. You know, <laughs> I, I think that's called... Um, prior art or <laughs> That's right. I, I think their patent's invalid. <laughs> <laughs> the bacteria invented it before them. Okay. So this is, this, is, this is what's in it for the bacteria. The bacteria can cross airspace, okay, which is certainly present in the soil at some times. One more thing. It gets even better than that. The transferring of the fungi by the bacteria can, can take place across terrain which has antifungal agents. So picture this. Picture you mix the two, the bacteria and the fungi in the middle of the plate, and then some space apart, you make a little strip of antifungal agent. The fungi can't grow there, they're dead, and so forth. Or they're not necessarily dead, but they're, they, are, they can't grow there. The bacteria have no problem crossing that because they don't know antifungal from Adam. So they cross it, and they carry the conidia to the other side. So all of a sudden, the fungi find that they can be transported across areas, conceivably in the soil, which could be very inimical to mm. them. It's cool. really very, very bad. So this is, this is all around a bit of mutualism that I think is mind-boggling. And the one thing to remember is that when bacteria go from a, a very moist environment to the very hostile environment of air, we learned this long ago making aerosols of bacteria, that you actually lose a substantial viability, uh, you lose a substantial part of the viable population when you undergo that phase transition from, if you will, the liquid environment of the agar surface to the air environment. And so the bacteria, when they have to go into this air gap by using these ladders, they are actually conferred the selective advantage because they're not having to do the phase transition that right. normally results in between 20 and 50% of a loss in viability to the population. So you can see how a population could quickly incorporate this set of genetic traits necessary and sufficient to make use of these ladders. Uh, you're assuming that the high, the surface of the si- hyphae is wet, which it probably is. I think that's not yeah. a bad assumption. Yeah. Okay. Now I think this is very good. I think this is so. This is about the story. There is more to it, but I'll I'll stop right here because I think uh, the main thing it illustrates is that these things can happen, and uh, there's going to be, I hope, a lot of attention given to mechanisms of the sort, to how microbes transfer their bodies from one place to another, not just in soil. So one thing that comes to mind is, this of course is all done in a Petri dish. Can right. you, is there something you can do in soil to show that this well, happens? 
this I I have yeah I used I but I used to take some Pasteur pipettes and fill them with sterile soil, and uh, we did that a few times. We we put the bugs on the top, and of course at the bottom we sort of dripped liquid through it, and at the bottom you retrieve the bugs faster than you would have thought. Uh -huh. okay. What we didn't do, and I can kick myself, is to do the same experiment that they did. Only we, did, we wouldn't have thought about using fungi, but maybe using other bacteria, because we did find that these guys push around other bacteria just fine. Mm -hmm. They push around any particle, uh, almost. Well, in the case of fungi, there's some specificity, but in the case of other bacteria, they just pushed anything around. So we could have looked at the eluate from our little soil columns, but guess what? We just didn't do it. Mm. And I, uh, this, I'm, I, I'm talking about this subject in a bittersweet way because uh, we were very playful about this. We didn't have a, we didn't intend to even write a grant or even write a paper. We were playing around, but we could have gone a little bit further. And so, when twenty years later somebody publishes a great paper, on the one hand I'm very glad, on the other hand I can kick myself and say, hey, "Geez, why didn't we think of that?" Yep, I know that's, that's life, feeling. isn't it? That is. But it's good that you still have the passion that you feel that way, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, because there is a probably a receptor on the aspergillus so you could maybe think about having mutants at some point that are defective and being carried right right that, that would right. give you it a would nice be reduced to the state of being like the other fungi that don't make it yeah, yeah. exactly so uh, so so maybe if you could make such mutants you could put them in soil and see if they can move around and so forth so right right very, is this the first time a microbe has been shown to carry another or has that been done before no, uh, it's been done before. Uh, as I say, it's been shown that fungi can carry bacteria. That's been known for it some time. That bacteria, and of course, fungi are much bigger. Yeah. An average hypha is about eight, ten micro, micrometers across. So you know, it's a giant, and so it's a gargantua carrying a little, a little dwarf. It's not a problem, but the dwarf carrying gargantua—that's news. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where the that's I think where the news is. But no, it's been known that bacteria can move other bacteria around. That's been proposed at least. But you know, it's funny. Uh, the, I I even run into some papers by um, a very fine uh, dental microbiologist at the Forsyth uh, Clinic in Boston, uh, Sokransky, who sh talked about some um, dental bacteria, hmm. uh, Capnocytophaga, which is motile, I think it has a different name now, uh, moving around some other bacteria. And uh, this may have been something that had something to do with gingivitis, with the establishment of gingivitis. It's never followed up. I, just, I, I looked and looked and looked. Maybe it has been, but I couldn't find it. So there are reasons for wanting to study the cooperation, the mu possible mutualism between microbes uh, regarding transport in many other places, including the human body. Did I hear you there, Joe? Well, I was just confirming that there are, are a number of examples of small organisms um, transporting others, bacteria and bacteria, or fungi transporting smaller ones. I just found this absolutely mind-boggling that these tiny bacteria could get together and transport this enormous fungus. Just, just amazing. Yeah, I, I told Elio earlier, it's sort of like the ants that carry uh, huge pieces of leaves, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of, that, you know, you, you see these ants that can carry 600 times their body weight, uh -huh. and it's, you know, it's not the same in terms of physics, but it is conceptually. It's just remarkable that it can work. That's a great paper, Elio. Thanks for finding that. And I guess we revi we revived uh, some uh, long-standing feelings in you going over that. <laughs> you did. You did. That's Thank great. you for letting me have that. So do send us the link to his site with the uh, okay with the photos. That would be great to post as well. But there's an interesting um, sort of segue between this paper and the others in that the Pennybacillus swarming also rescues uh, aspergillus from antifungal agents. That's right. And I think that's another remarkable thing that the bacteria are, are protecting. Um, that that reminds me actually of the the sharks that have these little fish on them that <laughs> eat the parasites. Yeah, yeah. Um, that the, the the little bacteria are protecting the big fungus from chemicals is kind of cool. It's a great story, and I think that your point, Elio, is correct. You get a physicist, and they have a totally different view of things, and they don't—they don't come pre-supplied with all the biases that we have. Right? That's right. 
So let's move on to our next two papers. These have to do with uh, resistance to antibiotics, but in a very different way, I think you'll find very interesting. And the first is, they're both science papers. They were back-to-back recently. And the first is called Hydrogen Sulfide, a Universal Defense Against Antibiotics in Bacteria. And these three papers, if there's anything in common for me, they are, I totally had no idea that this happened. And so I really learned a lot. And so, Michael, hydrogen sulfide. I get to sulfide. tackle the first one. The, the hydrogen sulfide one, the title really says it all. And to, to take a page from our, our good friend, Amy Chang Vollmer, who has been on a single-handed crusade to reinvigorate the teaching of, of basic metabolism in all aspects of microbiology. This paper is brought to us by biochemists. Who better than to understand uh, metabolism than the biochemist? And it's brought to us by a, a group from um, the Department of Biochemistry at New York State or excuse me, New York University School of Medicine and the State Research Institute of Genetics and Selection of Industrial Microorganisms in Moscow, Russia. And I'm not going to try to pronounce their names because I'll probably do them injustice. And it's a really fascinating paper. Every Everyone knows what hydrogen sulfide is because they've all smelled the rotten egg smell. And so this material that every human finds uh, revolting to, to smell actually has been shown in this paper through an elegant series of experiments. It's a relatively easy paper in the sense that there's only three figures, but this is a science paper, so the three figures are actually the equivalent to 40 figures. <laughs> by, the time, by the time you go to the supplemental materials and, and really begin to noodle your way through the paper. And so here's the story in a nutshell. There are three genes that are responsible for the production of hydrogen sulfide in microorganisms as well as mammals. H2S has been shown to have beneficial functions in mammals and they do this in their introduction to really pique the reader's interest in science from vasorelaxation, cardioprotection, neurotransmission, and anti-inflammatory activity in the GI tract. And when you, when you sit back and, and you if you've listened to any of our TWIMs in the past, you know about the story about salmonella in H2S and its ability to take the H2S produced by our colonocytes and it gets converted to tetrathionate, which confers to salmonella this wonderful, remarkable ability to outgrow anything in our gut. But here, the H2S is actually serving as a universal defense mechanism for those bacteria in our guts to protect them from antibiotics. And there's principally, they, they looked at three genes that are responsible for the production of hydrogen sulfide or involved in the production of hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. The first is cystothione beta synthetase. The second is cystathione um, gamma lyase. And the third is 3-mercaptopyruvate sulfur uh, transferase. And they abbreviate these as CBS, CSE, and 3-MST. So you'll get lost in the abbreviations. But if you just keep in the back of your mind as you're listening to us today that what we're talking about is mutants that effectively prevent the production of of H2S. And this H2S, if you think about what hydrogen sulfide really is, just think of it as water but with sulfur. And we all remember enough of our metabolism to appreciate the fact that what water results from is our cells dumping electrons through the electron transport chain into molecular oxygen to ultimately make water. Here in the case of the hydrogen sulfide, what we're having is it's again serving as a protectant. And so they they developed their story 
with the fact that these genes are ubiquitous and they have four test microbes in which they ask a very simple simple question. We have mutants in CBS, CSE, or 3MST, and we ask before and after the mutation whether or not these organisms are more sensitive or less sensitive to a suite of antibiotics that they expose them to, and they're able to measure H2S by a colorimetric assay because it's easy to test for the production of hydrogen sulfide because, again, this goes back to freshman chemistry where it will produce a dark substance or precipitant on a piece of, of filter paper if it is indeed present. So they can measure the concentration of H2S just by looking at how dark a uh, piece of filter paper gets and it's really pretty clever in how they present the data and and that's what you'll find in figure one. In figure one you have uh, Bacillus anthracis, E. coli, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They're test organisms and they have their filter paper impregnated with the the lead which is going to react with the hydrogen sulfide to produce the precipitate and the net consequence is they see this this remarkable dark color when it's wild type and in the mutants um, they don't actually see as much color development um, because of the absence of the production of the hydrogen sulfide they do a series of growth curves and they ask what is actually going on and as they evolve their story they begin to um, talk about the story about how they perceive the hydrogen sulfide is um, interacting and supporting the microorganism when it's exposed to the oxidative attack that's often associated with antibiotics. And they postulate that it's the oxidation component of or the oxidative component of antibiotics that is responsible for the toxicity and what the hydrogen sulfide does is serves as a protectant. And here we have to go into a little bit of, of chemistry and um, what they suggest is hydrogen sulfide bolsters the antioxidant capacity of bacterial cells by effectively serving to um, prevent the Fenton reaction from occurring. And so we have to have a digression of, of what the good old Fenton reaction is. And the Fenton reaction was discovered long ago in 1894 by the guy by the name of Fenton. And he found that several metals have a, a special ability to transfer oxygen properties um, to things like hydrogen peroxide. And so in the case of the classic Fenton reaction, you have Fe plus 2 reacting with hydrogen peroxide, which is a normal interaction or a byproduct of metabolism in cells, which is why um, a large number of cells have catalase. Anaerobes or strict anaerobes don't have catalase or superoxide dismutase. And so they deal with um, oxygen toxicity by dying in the presence of oxygen, which is why they're often referred to as strict anaerobes. Oxygen is, is just too toxic to them. But in the Fenton reaction, the iron plus two reacts with the peroxide, which is a normal byproduct of metabolism because of where to dump electrons in, in real time. And you end up with Fe plus three and a hydroxy radical and hydroxyl with another additional electron. And these, of course, are often referred to as highly reactive hydroxyl species or free radicals. And it's these free radicals that then go off and literally begin to attack the cell through peroxidation of their membranes, through the bleaching of proteins, and then most importantly, through the cleavage or breakage of DNA. And they in their supplemental material, describe how they evaluated this with pulse field gel electrophoresis to demonstrate that these mutants can indeed um, 
how hydrogen sulfide serves as a, a protectant to effectively um, prevent the microorganism from succumbing um, to different classes of antibiotics. And if you begin to go through the paper and begin to decipher um, figure two, they threw an elegant series of, of experiments in panels A all the way through F demonstrate how hydrogen sulfide protects against the antibiotic inflicted oxidative damage and um, they can use things like um, gentamicin in some of their experiments and they also use uh, naledixic acid and other antibiotics that have different uh, molecular targets within the cell to demonstrate that this behavior of hydrogen sulfide serving as, if you will, a universal protective mechanism for the cells uh, really helps them out. Why does uh, why do these antibiotics induce an oxidative state? What is the the mechanism there? Uh, maybe I could take that. Sure. Uh, they they increase um, respiration by inhibiting their their primary target. So even though the primary target may be inhibiting translation or transcription um, or some other part of the cell, mm -hmm. one of the cell's responses to that inhibition is apparently a high respiration rate, which then generates re reactive oxygen species. So it's a very, it's a little known effect of antibiotics because we think of them as just sort of halting the cell in, in its tracks. And in fact, the cell is having a very complex response to the antibiotics, and one of those is this high rate of respiration, which ultimately kills the cell. So it's kind of a, an ironic um, effect that it's it, the direct reason for death may actually be something the cell does to itself and not the effect of the antibiotic itself. Hmm. Well, they gasp for air. Aren't they? It's like the gasping for air. Yeah, exactly, and the, and the gasping is is actually quite uh, damaging to them. Right, and and I think that's what they were able to show with these these mutants and and the supplemental material. I think it was in the supplemental material. They actually show how these genes are distributed throughout the microbial kingdom, and that these hydrogen sulfide facilitating enzymes to make hydrogen sulfide really serve as a, a if you will a universal uh, protectant because there's a lot of things that result in oxidative damage to the cell because metabolism by itself is is an assault on the cell uh, because oxygen um, is often limiting in the case of the aerobes and in the anaerobes they truly have a conundrum in the sense that they're always trying to dump their waste electrons into uh, an electron acceptor. And, and the best ones that everyone knows are the short-chained fatty acids that effectively provide the stink that's often associated with folks uh, uh, worth working with, with anaerobic bacteria. The, that's where they're dumping their waste electrons is into these short-chain fatty acids. Um, like acetic acid, pyruvic acid. Yeah, lactic acid is probably the big one uh, that everyone knows because pyruvate, uh, if it can't transfer the electrons to oxygen, will go and make lactic acid in order to regenerate the oxidized form of NAD to begin electron accepting even though the anaerobes effectively generate their ATP via substrate level phosphorylation, they still need oxidized NAD and they still have to figure out where to put it. And so again, as as Joe points out, is you know, this this metabolic conundrum that the microbe is faced with when it's exposed to antibiotics really um, is is quite detrimental. And if you think about it, um, some of the antibiotics that are that are used f specifically um, for anaerobes like metronidazole, actually, if you if you think about it, are really 
uh, provided as a prodrug, and it's only when the electrons are given to it from the anaerobe that the metronidazole uh, realizes its full potential, and then that activated metronidazole goes off and, and causes the mm-hmm. oxidative damage to the the cell, principally by attacking the DNA, and then the DNA, of course, uh, is destroyed. Hmm. So, let me see if I've got this then. The antibiotics induce an oxidative state. The hydrogen sulfide helps protect against oxidative damage. And one of the ways that you said is by inhibiting this Fenton reaction. Uh, And they also mentioned that the hydrogen sulfide stimulates normal antioxidants like catalase, right? So you remove the H2S, you're more sensitive to antibiotics. Does that suggest that that's a good target, these genes for increasing the activity of antibiotics? Uh, That's, you know, I think the whole, I think this is, you know, if I was sitting on the editorial board of science and I'm, I'm reading this for the general consumption of the scientific readership, that's one of the things I would say is it, it's opening they do up. Say. They do say. Yeah, yeah. three new targets. Hmm. Three this, new targets. That's mentioned. That's mentioned. Right. And, these, and these enzymes in E. coli are presumably different enough from the enzymes we have that uh, you can make the drug selective enough, right? Hopefully. 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 Point. You have to look at the, mech, you know, the, the specific center of act, um, sure, uh, sure, active sure. site of the enzyme, sure. but you, you always are hopeful that the, the chemists are clever enough to, to design an inhibitor that will go after this. And if their supposition is correct, and this is what figure three is about, uh, they also talk about nitric oxide, and, and figure three specifically talks about the synergistic action of hydrogen sulfide and nitric oxide, and we all know that nitric oxide is a is a good antioxidant as well. And um, you again see uh, you have the synergistic activity of the two antioxidants, if you will, in, in the case. And they did the experiment with uh, the Bacillus anthracis cells, and and so it's 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 a rather interesting approach to give us new ideas for new new targets because. Up until recently, the classic targets for antimicrobials for bacteria have been uh, cell wall biosynthesis, uh, membranes, which, you know, because the membrane is so similar to eukaryotic membranes, haven't been a a very good approach, Uh, nucleic acid, DNA, RNA, and of course, protein synthesis, because of the wonder of the ribosome of being different in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Well, hopefully that'll lead to new uh, new approaches. Combine one of these antibiotics with an inhibitor of hydrogen sulfide production. Right. Uh, Michael, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, I have, I, looking at the paper, I couldn't tell. Maybe you found, where did they get these ideas? I mean, where does this come from? It's a little bit uh, far <laughs> It's sort of just a or, bolt out of the blue. I think if if I had to guess, it, my suspicion is it came from nitric oxide. Uh-huh. That's that's where I would have thought it it came came from. Would you expand um, on that? Go, go ahead, keep talking. <laughs> um, you know, they they sort of tease us in, in the beginning of the introduction. They say like. Nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide is produced enzymatically in various tissues, and they give the the three places. And so I think since nitric oxide has been such a hot area in uh, eukaryotic biology, I think being biochemist, um, they um, look at the microorganisms as tools to do biochemistry. And I think that's where they may have... Um, encountered this but it would always be good to hear from the authors to see where they got this great idea i I had a similar thought i just thought it seems to be random almost but uh out of nowhere so dramatic my goodness i mean they say they wanted to know uh, the function of hydrogen sulfide right which is i guess reasonable but then uh then they looked at antibiotic sensitivity so they had to have some clues as you say Well, I think there's a long-standing hypothesis that um, has been promoted quite a bit, actually, in just the last few years, that 
uh, bactericidal antibiotics act through the oxidative pathways yeah. and, yeah, and lead to production of superoxide and these other toxic oxygen derivatives. And so I think they, they knew that hydrogen sulfide has an effect on the oxidative state of the cells. And so maybe they put those two things together and, and tested the antibiotic sensitivity. And supplemental figure 14 is their proposed mechanism. And what they have central in smack dab in the middle is reactive oxygen species. And they have a, a dash line, antibiotics lead to more reactive oxygen species. And then you have uh, hydrogen sulfide driving the production of catalase and superoxide dismutase. And they, they describe, you know, this whole issue of um, how to alleviate the oxidative uh, stress. And they, they propose their mechanisms, um, depletion of free cysteine, which fuels the Fenton reaction, inhibition of the Fenton reaction by the hydrogen sulfide, which then reacts with the peroxide and diminishes free iron Fe plus 2, and then the stimulation of catalase and superoxide, which you can tell these were biochemists because the majority of the microbes on the planet are aerobes that – I mean, excuse me, are anaerobes that don't have superoxide dismutase nor catalase. And so I, I think that's a, a rather interesting um, component of their model is they, they sort of um, cheat and, and only think about the aerobic world. And well, it's fair, but it's fair to say that most pathogens – are either aerobes or facultative, that in fact the anaerobes, are terribly important in medicine, are really not a majority component, are they? No, that's absolutely true. So maybe from that point of view, they're right. And when you're designing antibiotics, you don't want to kill off the good bugs in our right. bodies, which are principally anaerobes, and you'd really want to just take out the bad actors, which are principally aerobes or facultative aerobes, facultative anaerobes. So um, this is one of those instances where I'd actually encourage you to look at the supplemental figures. It's, it's getting more and more challenging as we've gone to <laughs> electronic publications where you can cheat and put a lot more data into the supplements, and it, it makes the paper much more challenging to digest. And that's, you know, I guess the function of the editors are they're going to have to get better at not stuffing so much stuff into the supplemental material. Well, on the other hand, you're spared the pains of having to read enormous details in the primary paper. So, I don't that's know. True. It's a trade-off. It, it, it is a trade-off. A trade-off. It, it is a trade-off, and you do get to see it, – it, ha- it prevents you from having to go to hunt for everything because the authors are doing the hunting for you by stuffing it into exactly. the supplement, which I actually find um, – very helpful. And of course, it's also referenced so you can then, you know, find other interesting things. The last thing I want to talk about on this paper is, um, you know, as you go to the end and you begin to look at the references, and since science starts papers back to back, there's uh, those people who were interested in our Wolbachia story from a few episodes ago. There's another paper in this particular science issue about Wolbachia enhancing uh, Drosophila stem cell proliferation and targeting the germ lice stem cell niche. So if you're interested in the Wolbachia story, you can take a look at the science paper that follows uh, immediately after this hydrogen sulfide one. Yeah, I saw that too. That's very interesting. All right, great, Michael. Thank you. And this uh, paper was joined in the same issue, in fact, uh, right before it, by a second on the same idea, the idea of antibiotics and oxidative uh, stress. And its title is Active Starvation Responses Mediate Antibiotic Tolerance in Biofilms and Nutrient-Limited Bacteria. So Joe is going to tell us all about this one. I found this a particularly fascinating paper because it integrates a number of different hypotheses and and just sort of long-standing questions that have mystified people. And so one is is the the pathway we've just talked about that antibiotics um, have have stimulated oxidative responses that seem to be contributing to cell death. 
Um, and that's been one hypothesis of why cells die from antibiotic treatment. The other one that is really interesting is that we've known for a long time that bacteria that are living in biofilms are very resistant to antibiotics. And there may be a number of reasons for that because we know that there are, there are physical blocks to the antibiotics even entering the biofilm. But there are other situations under which bacteria have um, these you know, physical slime layers and other things protecting them where they're not as antibiotic um, resistant or tolerant. And I think this paper begins to explain that. So it brings together these two ideas of uh, antibiotic um, induction of, of respiratory stress and the idea of biofilms by looking at nutrient starvation. And they're arguing that under nutrient starvation conditions, um, which are very common in a biofilm, because usually a biofilm is kind of a climax community. It's, it's what results from the um, usage of all of the nutrients that are present and often stops growing because there are no longer nutrients available. Gee, that's, that's a nice way of saying it. I'm glad you said that. The climax community. Very good. <laughs> See, I'm violating my own rule there, though, because I'm always telling the biofilm people not to call a single species uh, group of organisms a community, because a community is, by definition, multi-species. So I just broke uh -huh own rule and somebody's going to catch me on it but it is you'll like, get a letter you'll yeah. get a letter <laughs> uh, but I, I do think of it as a climax community because of its its essential stability um, and that it has kind of finished its major job as as a, a growth organism and so if you assume that then biofilms are under some sort of nutrient stress they don't have more food to grow on and then you can imagine that they're going to be turning on the responses um, that, that are associated with nutrient starvation. And the big one that has been studied for a long time in bacteriology is called the stringent response. And that is a response to a number of different stresses, but nutrient starvation is certainly one of them. And what this group found is that they find the stringent response to be highly expressed in biofilms, stable biofilms that have reached that climax state. And when the stringent response is turned on, it removes reactive oxygen species just like the hydrogen sulfide does. So that's the commonality between these two papers is that these are two very different mechanisms of reducing reactive oxygen species in the cell. And either one of these, either the uh, stringent response enzymes or the hydrogen sulfide, reducing the reactive oxygen species will reduce death uh, caused by antibiotics or anything else that is producing these free radicals in the cell. And so anything that reduces these reactive oxygen species that, as Michael said, will begin to tear apart the membranes, the DNA, the proteins, because they have these extra electrons that make them so reactive, uh, anything that reduces those will protect the cell from antibiotic killing, uh, which seems to be associated with the production of more of these reactive oxygen species. So they did a really nice job of using both a genetic approach, where they, in one case, uh, knocked out the stringent response, and showed that um, there was a loss of antibiotic tolerance when the stringent response was no longer turned on. And then in another case, they used a, a chemical to fool the cells into thinking that they were starved for a particular amino acid, serine. And in that uh, pseudo-starvation case, they achieved the, the same effect as having the stringent response turned on and that was that the cells became much more tolerant to antibiotics. And one of the striking things here was the effect, the size of the effect that they saw. So in some of the cases, they saw a 2,000 or more fold increase in resistance. So that's more than three orders of magnitude difference in the sensitivity to antibiotics, which from a clinical perspective is clearly pretty significant that if you knock down antibiotic killing by a thousand fold, uh, that's going to be a real problem for uh, the antibiotic having an effect on infectious disease. 
So I think they, although it was, uh, the work was done in an in vitro biofilm setting, I think it's pretty easy to translate this to a, an animal setting where you might be treating for disease and imagine that um, the, this effect could be quite dramatic in um, affecting antibiotic sensitivity in either direction. And of course, the one we'd like to go in is to make these bacteria more sensitive to antibiotics which means uh, removing some of the protective mechanisms. Uh, as Mike was saying, removing protection that they gain from hydrogen sulfide, or in this case, the protection they gain from the stringent response. I'm reminded of uh, work by Engelbert Kulka, where she talked about program cell death, and uh, that had to do with the uh, stringent response. And I believe that uh, she also showed that this is involved in antibiotic sensitivity. Do you happen to know much about it? No, I hadn't heard that. That's really interesting. I'll have to go back and look at her work. Yeah, I think there's a connection there, anyhow. Yeah, I, you know, I think there have been hints in for literally decades of some of these connections, and people have just kind of scratched their heads and wondered, <laughs> well, why would the stringent response be associated with antibiotic tolerance and right, right. How would stress be associated with antibiotic killing and they just they couldn't quite get to mechanisms and the beauty of these two papers and particularly that they appear together is that they, it begins to produce a very cohesive model of how antibiotics kill and then the various activities that bacteria have that protect them uh, from antibiotics and more importantly it drives home how to begin to think about developing inhibitor trials that will accelerate one versus the other in order to, because you can't do this in a vacuum because you have to know by, by knocking down hydrogen sulfide, what effect is it going to have overall on the physiology of a community? And you really have to begin to, to tease it apart. So I think, you know, the editors of science should be commended for, you know, really making the conscious effort to put them next to one another. Yeah, it happens rarely, but it happened this time. So that's very yeah. nice. So, Joe, this uh, stringent response, they, they knocked out two genes called RHEL-A and SPO-T. What, what are these? Does anyone know? Yeah. They are both involved in making the effector of the stringent response, which is um, PPGPP, that is a tetraphosphate of guanosine. I see. And this is uh, plus another one. So this is, they're, they're both involved in that. One, um, the SPO-T has a double function. I mean, it degrades it also, but it's also involved in its biosynthesis. Okay. So these are, these are so it's, it's, they stand for the stringent response. And this this uh, this effector PPGPP is then is involved in the expression of other genes that have the actual protected. Well, it does affect transcription. And, yeah, right. Uh, Joe probably knows more about it than I do. It affects transcription directly, although I'm not. Sh I don't know, Joe. Has this been worked out really to the end? Well, maybe not to the end. Is there ever an end in science? Um, <laughs> But PPGPP was this mysterious molecule that was called magic spot for a very long time because it was identified as a spot on a chromatogram and it wasn't obvious what it was or how it fit into cell metabolism. But people knew that it had these magnificent effects on gene regulation and uh, particularly involved in the stringent response. And finally, uh, I think we do have a pretty good handle on uh, we certainly know the structure of PPGPP now, and it's no longer just magic spot. Um, and I think we know an awful lot about the genes that it, it regulates yeah. and the mechanisms by which it, it um, interfaces in transcription. There is a an assay for PPGPP and PPPGPP here, which I haven't seen in years, and that is in figure 1A, thin layer chromatography. <laughs> When's the last time you saw that in a science paper? <laughs> It's amazing. So these two genes would be, again, targets for inhibitors that would potentiate the uh, efficacy of antibiotics, just like uh, the genes for hydrogen sulfide production, right? Hopefully there's enough difference between them so you could act, you know, the, the name of the game is 
today is to make your antibiotic as, as specific as possible so you don't harm the good bacteria. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, as resistance emerges... Uh, which always seems to happen, uh, you're not going to get a broad class of resistance uh, and it will still have some activity. Yeah, sure. One of the, I, I thought kind of scary things in, in this paper was the high level of resistance that they saw to meripenem. And that was of concern because the penem antibiotics are these uh, fourth generation uh, beta lactam, so that's the class that penicillin um, was was the first generation of, and there has been relatively little resistance sh uh, showing up in bacteria to the meripenem or penem type antibiotics, and they're seeing pretty high level resistance um, in in these stressed or starved bacteria, and that kind of frightened me. That, that that's a pretty simple mechanism by which bacteria can become antibiotic resistant. They don't have to acquire a gene. They don't even have to acquire a mutation. Uh, they just have to go into this sort of starvation state and turn on a set of genes that they already have, and they may become resistant. So I, I was quite sobered by that since this is a new class of antibiotics that we rely yeah, so that, on. That speaks, that, if I may, that speaks to... Um uh, resistance in one sense, the uh, the uh, the antibiotic will still keep the bugs from growing, and that's what virulence is all about. The in bacteriostatic antibiotics have their place, so uh, you know until of, it, it's not necessarily so glum. I don't think, but maybe it is. <laughs> Well, if you're using, yeah, I agree. If you're using a bacteriostatic antibiotic um, deliberately, anyway, that's fine. But if if you're imagining that you're actually killing off the bacteria, um, this is really a, a cautionary right. tale. And I think the concern is that the biofilms can be um, can can sit there and survive for quite a while, and then when nutrients become available again, come back to life. And right, work. so it's persistence of the infection. You're quite right. Course. The persistent state that, that's so concerning, you know, particularly on a catheter or some other medical device where biofilms so often uh, form, sure. uh, they can hang around for a long time and just wait for the time to be ripe and, uh, and then start causing trouble. Very true. All right. Thanks for that, Joe. That's great. Two great papers, three great papers today, and two of them very highly related. It's a nice story. Uh, let's uh, do a couple of emails. We have two here to read. Uh, the first one is from Joe. And Elio, this one is uh, for you to answer, so listen carefully. Hello, Vincent and Elio. Your recent discussion of mitochondrial interconnections reminded me of a paper by Duby and Ben Yehuda I saw earlier this year describing intercellular communication utilizing tiny nanotubes that are EM visualizable and that can transfer DNA, RNA, and protein from bacterium to bacterium. These structures are able to connect distinct bacterial species and can confer transient antimicrobial resistance as well as other phenotypes from one species to another. I was completely blown away by this paper, and it forced me to think about all of the things that we still don't really understand about the bacterial world. The paper is worth looking at, if only for the beautiful microscopy work and elegant experimental details. I wonder if you'd care to comment on whether this type of mechanism could explain the origins of the mitochondrial interconnections that you were discussing on TWIM 21. The paper that Joseph refers to um, has left me a little bit, wondering a little bit. They did Beautiful stuff, all right, but they did. They left out some simple essays for. They didn't ask it for resistance directly. They did it in a funny way of mixing cells from different strains together. What I'm saying is, uh, I wish there would be a little bit more independent confirmation. The electron microscopy is certainly convincing, but you know, you're seeing structures which are possible conduits of uh, genetic information, but yeah, you know. Uh, to quote Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And it's a little bit this side of that. So I'm not, I'm not saying the paper is wrong. I'm saying I'm holding judgment. I'm withholding judgment for a little bit. 
but uh, certainly it's possible. But what they said there is possible. Uh, the original mitochondria that were made by the original bacteria may have been uh, certainly something that is very different from today. Mm. He writes, I really enjoy the program as it lets me keep up on interesting developments in areas of microbiology outside of my own field. So Joe is a postdoc at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Thank you, Joe. And the next one is from Don, who writes, All hail the microbiologist's extraordinary. Wow. That's I, awesome. I don't think so. It's that not, must be somebody else. It's not me. <laughs> I look. This one's for you, Michael. I look forward to your discussion of the paper on the use of copper to discourage bacterial growth, as you discussed in an early TWIM. I was able to convince myself using a copper-plated car battery and copper sulfate, i.e. root killer and chicken broth for a medium, and <laughs> clarity as an endpoint. I have since switched to brass as it is more durable and already out there in the market, avoiding the medical vendor or defense contractor monetary <laughs> gouge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but the results have not been quite so clear-cut. Could you speculate or theorize why this might be so for an alloy of copper and zinc versus copper alone? I delight in your podcasts and have filled out your questionnaire. Best to you all, and please keep going. Well, thank you first for filling out the questionnaire. That really will help Vincent and the other producers keeping the, these podcasts fresh. And, you know, thinking to the mechanism, um, we, when we think of the Fenton reaction, we only think of iron. But copper, because it has two valences just like iron, is also can also do the Fenton reaction. And there, uh, I like to call your attention to a couple of papers that have come out this past year, 2011. One was a mini review and uh, applied in environmental microbiology. And we'll put a link on the site um, uh, des describing the mechanism of action of antimicrobial copper. And then there's going to be a paper that uh, uh, there's a family of papers that are coming out and applied in environmental microbiology uh, by Bill Kevel's group out of the University of Southampton, where he's actually done a series of elegant experiments showing how uh, the copper is actually responsible uh, for resulting in strand breakage of DNA, very similar to what we saw with um, uh, the mutants in which hydrogen sulfide or the antibiotics result in uh, the oxidative damage uh, creating the uh, free radicals that are then responsible for the breakage of the DNA and the mere act of transporting in copper plus into uh, the bacterial cell then results in that um, breakage of the DNA. So, it, it is a, um, uh, if you will, a root killer because DNA, of course, without DNA, you don't get more cells. And um, the, f the combination of, of how the copper results in an oxidative burst inside the cell is really, um, I think, what is actually going on as, as the um, copper metal is uh, taking out the microbes uh, on those surfaces. I so love thanks his, for your question. I love his endpoint, clarity. Clarity is good. <laughs> it's just great. It's what, we, it's what all good writers strive for. I mean, you know, writing, writing um, extremely tight and, and uh, simplifying, simplifying, or shortening, shortening uh, really uh, fuels the creative juices. Thank you, Don. And the, the questionnaire that he mentions, by the way, is you can find at triplemojo.com slash twiv. It's a listener survey to find out who's listening to our podcast. So if you haven't done that already, please do. I also want to point out that for the next general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology, uh, one of the sessions will be crowdsourced. In other words, you can decide the subjects. And I will provide a website in the show notes where you can go and type in a suggestion for a session, and then everyone votes on them, and the top five get selected to be scientific sessions. And if, you're, if you've suggested one of those top five, 
you can get help, financial help in going uh, to the meeting. I don't know if any of you have looked at that site, but there are a number of interesting uh, sessions already. The session, there'll be a session on beer microbiology. It'll be very popular. Yeah, that would be very good. So we'll put a link to that, and if you're you're motivated, please do that as well. Uh, that will do it for TWIM23. You can find us at microbeworld.org slash TWIM, and we're also on iTunes. If you use iTunes, please subscribe, and also leave a comment there if you haven't done so already. What that does is keeps us visible. It keeps us on the front page of the Medicine Podcast Directory, and that way more people can find us. And the more people that listen, uh, the better. Uh, we love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twim at twiv.tv. I want to thank everyone for participating today. Alio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Alio. Oh, my pleasure, as always. Great to have you, as always. Joe Handelsman is not too far from me at Yale University. Thank you, Joe. Oh, thank you. This was terrific. And uh, look forward to having you more in the new year. Yes, see you in 2012. 2012. Virtually, if only virtually. <laughs> Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent, and everyone else. It's always a pleasure talking science for a little bit on... Uh, we, d we do these on Friday afternoon, so it's a great way to end the week. It is a good way. And now here on the East Coast, it's dark and cold. It's the end of the day. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. Many thanks to the American Society for Microbiology for sponsoring TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.